Добрый день, уважаемые дамы. Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. We begin our round table to discuss industrial zones in a post-industrial city. Different countries and cities have uh, moved into post-industrial economy where uh, GDP uh, of services exceeds that of products and many cities and countries abandon the traditional uh, industry, industrial production and the latest uh, world crises have forced the economists to start thinking of uh, how correct this policy is, how important in industry is to mitigate risks and stabilize the situation. This is one topic that arouses uh, significant uh, disputes and debate in Moscow, whether Moscow needs the industry and uh, what to do to maintain retain and sustain this industry. Uh, at the same time, most experts uh, concur that Moscow has a significant potential uh, related to uh, industrial zones. I would like to give you a few numbers, and uh, many of those present here have heard more than once that there's 209 industrial zones in Moscow and uh, the zones cover some 8,000 hectares. And uh, if you add to those all the uh, plants and factories outside the zones but are engaged either in industrial production or uh, utilities and communal services, then the total area will reach 15,000 hectares covered by uh, these companies. Uh, now, these 15,000 hectares is uh, 150 square kilometers, and I would like you to understand how huge this territory is, because uh, uh, Paris, the city of Paris, covers 105 square kilometers, and the industrial zones located in Moscow uh, take about one and a half times the entire city of Paris. The topic that we would like to discuss today is uh, about the challenges that we will face, have already been facing in working with this potential, uh, how to uh, uh, embark on these uh, projects, uh, how to make them attractive for investors, because otherwise we will hardly be able to find the resources to do something about these industrial zones. Uh, on the other hand, these projects should uh, take into account the interests of the city, the citizens, the inhabitants, and uh, they should be in line with the long-term strategy of the city and uh, how to find, how to strike the right balance. We will have some very interesting experts speaking today. I hope that uh, most uh, will uh, find the answers. I would now like to give the floor to Daniel Brown. Daniela. Daniela is an artist. Uh, her works can be found not only in Germany, but in other countries uh, worldwide. And uh, today, Daniela is present here as a co-author and the leader of the project to uh, transform the Berlini factory that uh, went bankrupt a few years ago, uh, making it into a completely different space, making it attractive for the city. So over to you, Daniela. Please tell us about your experience. I'm sure it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Do you have a presentation, Daniela? Do you have a presentation? Yeah, with you. This is the presentation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oops. Um, can you hear me like this? Great. Thanks for inviting me and the project X Rotor Print here. <clears throat> 
It's um, a very special project, I think, in this context because it's done by the tenants. Um, created by this very fascinating architecture, we moved our studio spaces um, to the Berlin's Wedding District in the year 2000. This was years before the idea of Exota Print grew, and that means Exota Print is a project that has been realized by the people that were already on site. Um, I'm going to talk about an alternative ownership model and a very special concept of usership. Um, it's a 10,000 square meter premises, so it's for, for us it was quite big, but in this context we just heard from the Moscow context it's rather small. But it's in, this, in, in the inner city and it's developed without governmental aid, neither structurally nor financially. It's developed autonom autonomously based on the rents. Exalta Print is a non-profit development that puts the focus on using the space. It's not about private property or investment returns. We set up a model that has removed the property from the real estate market in order to serve a heterogeneous mix of users, work, art, and community outreach. It's an all-over community image to emerge here. The compound, compound is a historical listed site composed by Wilhelminian style buildings and buildings from the 1950s by architect Klaus Kirsten that are outstanding and that became a motivation for Exota Print and also a sign for it. <coughs> Exota Print offers a lot of spaces. Mm, we have about 11 buildings and today Exota Print runs about 90 rental contracts. Some more photographs. Um, this wasn't always like this. The former rotor print manufacturing site sat in limbo for 18 years. So the bankruptcy of rotor print was in 89. And in 2002, the Liegenschaftsform Berlin took over this, the property in order to sell it. The Liegenschaftsform, Liegenschaftsform Berlin is a city owned company that is in charge to sell city owned ground and real estate. So the site was to go to the highest bidder. But over the last decades, production and jobs have left the former working class district Wedding, a district that nowadays is known for unemployment, poverty, and precarious living conditions. Um, this problematic surrounding created a kind of protection sphere for our local project to develop from the bottom up. So this is what we call point zero. The investors were not yet active in this district. And we had this short moment in time that gave us the opportunity and the time to develop an alternative strategy. And nevertheless, as you can imagine, we had a lot of difficulties. Um, I don't want to go into details here, but to professionalize uh, in an initiative of renters is really a hard task. And we, we went through it and um, we had also um, to struggle to be taken serious as the developers on the site, to be seen as the future um, investors on this site. This is one photograph from this time when there was an Icelandic investor announced on the compound and we had to show that there are already people that want to, want to invest here. And this photograph, for example, was very convincing to the local politicians because it showed that at the Exota Print project there are a lot of different people involved and it's not only about artists. So, there was written, there's no profit to be made here on the, f on the picture before, and this is our solution to x print in order to install a sustainable development that opens a long-term perspective for the users. We designed two contracts that complement one another, a heritable building right and a non-profit partnership agreement. 
the heritable building right lasts for 99 years. And we negotiated the purchase up to the end, and then we appointed the foundation's trias and aided Marion to buy it. The foundations own the ground, and ex Print owns the building. That's the heritable building right. And the effect is that the property can't be sold again. And this is exactly the reason why we choose the heritable building right. It's not because it's cheaper than buying ourselves, so it's, we pay the annual interest to the foundation, but the premises are removed from the real estate market, and this gives us, again, time to develop on it. And in the contracts, we fixed the development to goals, to our utilization plan, to rent out to work, art, and community, and to prevent displacement and gentrification. Um, the other contract central to the development is the Exoter Print Nonprofit Limited Liability Company. Exoter Print Limited was founded by renters on site and is in charge for managing, financing, development, and renovation of the site. Within the partnership, we agreed on two nonprofit goals to maintain the historically listed site and to support arts and culture. So rents are the economic basis of the project and the non-profit status commits us to spend benefits on the declared non-profit goals. To make it very clear, the government is not involved in this project. It's a private development, but nevertheless, it pursues community interests. For example, the heritable building right would also be, it would also have been a good idea to set it up with the city of Berlin, but they wanted to sell it. There was no other way to, to have it. Um, and um, it's a discussion actually in Berlin if selling is always the right way to go, but for example, a long-term lease can, can bring it also into a new development. <clears throat> In our case, money is spent on the historically listed site, and that's exactly where money had to go. <clears throat> we took out a building loan <clears throat> for the renovation that we do by step by step while the compo compound is almost fully rented out. So this is another aspect of the project initiated by artists. ex Print is not intended to be a location for artists alone. No happy island of artists and no creative cluster. That was our idea. Instead, we developed a heterogeneous usage concept in order to include all social groups. This especially benefits the local community because they become an active part of the project. Inspired by an art term, this is what we call the social sculpture. Ex Print rents out a third of its space to each area of work, art, and community. One third is rented to local businesses, to production and manufacturing. One third is rented to social institutions and to community outreach organizations. This part offers the most to the local community. And one third of the spaces is rented by independent creatives and artists and musicians and graphic designers. So there is, for example, a school that teaches German to immigrants, a training center that gets dropout teenagers back to a regular shadow and to finish school. There are carpentries and wood workshops, a workshop specialized in neoprene young graphic designers, for example, that publish the magazine Their Wedding. And to give you an idea of the diversity, young creatives next to start-up businesses, the long-established Berlin-based electrician, the Turkish building contractor, the agency that works with long-term unemployed people. All these people have very different occupations, very different education, and backgrounds in living, um, but this kind of neighborhoods creates new collaborations that actually happen because they are all on one compound. 
Um, and it's a social capital, I would guess, that is created here and that you can't really measure in the short term, but in the long term, because you include all social groups, um, it, it has a lot of effects. Apart from this, Exalta Print is open for people and subjects to be brought in. There is a canteen and there are guest departments and we have a project space for events and conferences. <coughs> in summary, Exalta Print the most important to Exporta Print is, is, is its sustainable legal structure, a framework of two contracts that ensure the existence of the site and its declared goals independently of its initiators. Within this framework, it can be designed socially, economically, and culturally. So that's 100 years to create a social sculpture. And usually I stop here but it's from this 100 years, five years are already done. <laughs> and in the meanwhile, so we, we run Expert Print for five years now. In the meanwhile, we broadened the view and we started to involve in the nearest neighborhood. Expert Print has a lot of impact on the area and we see the need to expand our idea of a socially mixed and inclusive, inclusive development to the building grounds next to us. Unfortunately, the city of Berlin dismantled a part of the former factory already in 92, um, and the area is divided in fragments owned by different private and public companies. So the, our goal now is to unify this ground again, to open it up, to, make, to walk through, to build, and to do this again with and for the local community. In the former Rotaprint block, we would like to add to work, art, and community one more aspect, and that's affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. The idea of turning the former factory to a space for work and art and uh, for the community, I'm sure this project could be accomplished at the time when there is a serious driver like uh, a human individual or a group of people who would like to change and uh, that becomes a matter of their life and it's a very important stage and with this I'd like to pass over the word to the to Sergei Gordev. I'm sh uh, well I believe that uh, it's better to uh, initiate questions and answer in the end of the session and Sergei Gordev who accomplished more than uh, nine developing, 19 developing uh, projects, and uh, at least nine of them were made on the grounds of the former industrial enterprises, and I'm sure that Sergei's experience will be extremely important for us on two reasons. For here we see the commercial and business interests and, uh, of course, uh, these projects uh, brought a lot of positive things uh, for the citizens and for the city. And secondly, they were accomplished in Moscow and Russia. And Sergei knows and understands the specificity and peculiarities. Sergei, could you brief us on these uh, things? And uh, this is a very interesting German experience, and uh, at least uh, we are not mature enough uh, to reach their level uh, when the society combines its efforts and combines the multilateral drives and accomplishes this uh, project. I want to tell you about one story. I am the owner and the founder of Horace Company, which uh, constructed several projects and that was the experience of reconstruction of industrial enterprises and this is the project I'm going to brief you about and here we have a completely different story it's a fully commercial project. Uh, a factory was uh, bored and the factory was 3.6 hectares of lands and on the left there is a site where there appeared uh, uh, the living neighborhood 
and that was the image of the factory inside, and that was the factory which um, uh, belonged to Stanislavski and Alexeyev in uh, orthodox uh, area uh, of uh, Moscow, and uh, it manufactured uh, a thread, a silver thread, and after that the electric cable was manufactured, and now that's uh, how it looked like. And uh, two words about the, ma the, the master uh, plan. Do we have a pointer here? I will try to show you like this. This is the central uh, long building on the screen. So the central building here is the ancient building which uh, remained from this uh, merchant's family and uh, adjacent buildings were constructed at the times of the Soviet power and the long central building that was the uh, memorial of architect art and uh, there appeared a desire to restore it and the rest uh, of the buildings uh, were uh, re reconstructed completely. A uh, decision was also taken well the idea was to, to make a theater uh, the theater which was made by Stanislavski for his workers and uh, on the left you see the new uh, living quarters and the small hotel and the restaurant over there uh, let's have a look how it looks like uh, at present and this is the entrance to the uh, factory This is the office uh, of my company. We'll skip that very quickly. And that uh, is the internal territory uh, with the parking lot and several gardens. You see these gardens. and uh, small birch tree gardens uh, which bring some life in the space and this uh, building is the building of the theater and uh, the uh, uh, theater square and also the cherry orchard is over there that's uh, how uh, we see this uh, theater and it has been in existence for seven years it's a private theater and it is called the Studio of Theatrical Art. And uh, we see the interiors of the theater. And this is the living quarters. We have approximately 10,000 square meters of uh, space five buildings and this is uh, a compound and the quality of uh, uh, is superb and uh, initially people think that it's useless to build uh, apartments there for this uh, region was not very popular it was uh, selling very very successfully and so now it is completely sold and that was uh, initiated in 2005 and it was finished uh, in 2010 and the last uh, uh, effort was made with the cherry orchard. I will tell you more about the parameters. The uh, uh, office space for lease is approximately 30,000 square meters. The parking, underground parking lot 
uh, two level was created and one of the levels is uh, provided for the business center and another is for the living quarters. And uh, the team, the team of uh, architects, John McCaslin and partners, uh, uh, engineer Arup, design of the uh, Cherry Orchard, uh, Christopher uh, Bradley Hall, the uh, British landscape designer and uh, custom and company uh, from London. And this uh, project uh, received lots of international awards, Arabia London for the best international project of 2011. Then this uh, project also received uh, the award of Civic Award. And uh, lots uh, of uh, different awards, both Russian and international. Now, what can we say about uh, a distinctive feature of this project. First of all, this uh, project is uh, absolutely open to the uh, citizens living nearby, no gates, and there are four orchards, and the local people are coming in, and uh, they can use it 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, to use this orchards, uh, the uh, lessors and the people uh, who lived inside, they were against that. But however, we managed to convince them uh, to change their attitude. And this situation continues. So if you want to, you can just come up and uh, walk uh, inside the premises of this uh, site and uh, to enjoy the landscape uh, which is available there. And uh, actually, this project became part uh, not only of the private business, but uh, it's part of the city. And many delegations are coming here, including those of uh, architect delegations and the people who enjoy the scenery of a good landscape. And as far as the regulation on behalf of the city is concerned, there was no regulation. It was a private uh, project. and. Uh, we cooperated with the Committee on Protection of uh, uh, Monuments and Memorials, and uh, he actually was satisfied with the work which was done by us. With this, uh, I would like to finish off. If any questions uh, arise, I'm prepared to take them. So just let's uh, give this opportunity to the lady, just one question, and in the end, uh, we will be able to continue. Uh, excuse me, interpreter wouldn't hear the question. Once again, I'm interested about the uh, investing uh, details. Who was the investor? What were the conditions? Uh, uh, of uh, passing over the site to you, whether it paid off or not. The site was uh, bought uh, through the market uh, procedures for money, uh, and the office space was uh, sold, and uh, it was a very profitable project. So it paid back uh, very quickly, and uh, there was no, kind of, no, no, no social project uh, like we saw in Germany. And theater, theater is a private, uh, uh, it's, uh, it belongs to the private investor and the founder. It's a separate uh, element. He bought out uh, this uh, building, and it's a separate private theater. Thank you very much, uh, Sergey. I think we can be proud that uh, actually uh, Moscow also has some positive example how to change the former uh, factories and f industrial facilities. And in this concept, I enjoyed very much that it was an open project and unique for Moscow for uh, basically such uh, new uh, living uh, neighborhoods. They separate from the other city by fences and live by their separate nights. And uh, actually, the more project like this we have, Moscow will turn very quickly into a place comfortable for living for one. And uh, now I'm passing over the floor to Yuri uh, Gregorian, the creator of the Meganom uh, Architect Bureau. 
which created uh, many uh, beautiful buildings in Moscow and Meganom and Yuri, he was the winner uh, of the projects to develop uh, the uh, ZIL uh, facility, the automobile factory, which existed and ex still exists and occupies tremendous space. And Yuri is going to tell us what's going to happen with this patch of land. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't have any slides for we presented them at the press conference, and uh, I don't want to bore you with uh, details, and I will try to brief you on the reconstruction of the industrial facilities. We have seen two projects, local projects, and I think the most important thing here in industrial areas, uh, while having a great uh, number of these, it's a tremendous resource of the city and deserves uh, a large uh, architect uh, project. And uh, it's, of course, uh, we have uh, separate sites, but there should be a combined and comprehensive idea behind their development. And we've been involved in most various types of development of industrial areas and to find some kind of a general concept. And the last uh, project uh, which we offered to the government uh, in Zill, and uh, this uh, circular circular ring, which is consisting of the railroad, could uh, be named as a park uh, circle so that the electrical train uh, stops uh, every time in a small park. And uh, unfortunately, this project is not uh, revised comprehensively. I have seen many uh, drafts of the planning, and I think uh, well, they are lacking some general principles. The second uh, project, that was the Green uh, River, it is uh, uh, to uh, unite Bitsa and uh, Lassine Ostrov by a park, and we even calculated the density, and we estimated the economics of the projects that was at the time of the previous uh, administration of the city, and we thought that uh, once you declare such a project in the southeast uh, area, which is uh, uh, very close to the so-called poor regions, uh, we could uh, make uh, $80, $80 billion, even if the price uh, went up uh, by 30 percent, so not even double. Uh, size. So we also see non-material resources here and ideas also could uh, generate money for the city. And the ZIL project, it's just at the cross uh, road of uh, uh, Moscow River and the Green River and such uh, a big site where you don't have uh, to negotiate uh, things with investors. It should be uh, basically supervised by the city, and it could change the image of the city. And Sergei demonstrated that the Stanislavski project is uh, of a very high value, uh, not only for the city authorities but by architects. And the site with uh, the square area more than uh, 300 uh, hectares, it could change the city and could create a completely different balance in the city. And the key issue here for the development of such sites is transport uh, infrastructure. And uh, once we uh, started to do this, uh, the density which we might ha have there is equal to zero for a throughput capacity has been exceeded. So in order to accomplish any uh, comprehensive uh, project, it will completely depend on the situation of at, in the city. Uh, you won't be able just to put something on this area without developing transportation system. And I would like to outline some principles. The first, we need to create parks and greenery compensations. Second, in every site like this, it should turn into the test ground of some kind of a city concept. At ZIL, we suggested to uh, initiate the uh, principle of self-governance uh, in the city and to create a specific uh, district of the city. 
self-preservance, what we see in uh, Europe, maybe you don't have to destroy these buildings, maybe um, it's part of the identity, identi identity of these areas, uh, fourthly, uh, openness to the city and the public space. And actually, this is their accessibility or permeability. They should be open to the city and shouldn't be a closed clusters or enclaves. And this uh, also will be attributed to the matters of culture and uh, the issues of gentrification. Fifth, it's a mixed, uh, mixed uh, building approach and uh, the construction blocks should be mixed uh, to the maximum in terms of functionality. Six, uh, scalability. We don't have to create uh, large enclaves and functions. We have to try a smaller projects and to attract as many developers as possible and to preserve the functions of the city as coordinator. Seven, the role of these regions in their attempt to combine the uh, activity of adjacent areas, the social compensation for now we have more, ba more, more barriers and uh, we have to destroy them. And cooperation, number eight, in all possible spheres, this is uh, relevant to the uh, matters of trust without cooperation and uh, agreements of private investors with the city it wouldn't be possible to create such a project and uh, uh, the last one is interdisciplinary approach and we believe that uh, uh, not only architects should be involved into that uh, designs and interdisciplinary teams which would uh, involve the people of different trends and professions, and in the end, I'd like to say two things. I think we have a tremendous opportunity uh, to make a unique project out of industrial areas where the role of architects in these things could be the role of coordinator, where architects could coordinate interests. And second, uh, the Swiss uh, have a proverb, they say, we don't do anything in haste. And uh, actually, uh, we see the results uh, of the quality uh, of the lifestyle they live in. And uh, we believe that uh, 200 projects uh, are being now in the work concerning the areas belonging to Russian railroads. There is too much haste because uh, no specific uh, mechanisms of accomplishment and no public control is there. And I believe this is a long-term project and uh, we shouldn't, uh, we don't have the right to make uh, mistakes which were made in the past, and we have to avoid them uh, for the future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuri. I think uh, this uh, project uh, of ZIL planning is a most uh, complicated and uh, vast project so which is going to be accomplished in Moscow. We believe there are too many um, challenges and limitations, but there is a plus. There is only one owner, and I think it will be much uh, simpler to take the uh, decisions. And uh, when we have many owners and uh, many industrial zones in Moscow, they belong to many owners, this is a fairly big challenge and a fairly complicated issue. I would like to pass the word to Marcus Apitzeller, who has uh, an experience to create the master plans in many as in various uh, cities in uh, Europe and in China. And uh, with Marcus, we got acquainted with Marcus was a member of the jury uh, to choose uh, the project uh, of ZIL. Uh, renovation and Marcus has a tremendous experience in the work with different owners and we would appreciate if you could share the experience how to cooperate with them. 
Thank you. Um, first thing I have to say, I'm, I'm not sure whether experience always helps in, uh, in uh, achieving these projects because I think every project is, is different and uh, every project, and that's the nice thing about reuse of existing structures, it needs uh, a custom-made approach. But what I want to um, talk about is really the potential Moscow um, has in actually using this heritage you have actively uh, on one hand and on the other hand also um, um, in a way changed uh, the image Moscow has on a global scene and yesterday we have heard that the image is not, not that good. Now I think actually regeneration of industry in a particular uh, way and in a successful way can be a very useful tool in uh, in in changing an image of uh, of a city because um, I think and I believe that welcome uh, that uh, Moscow has actually the potential to become the world capital of what I want to want want to call loft living uh, which is a particular lifestyle um, rather than uh, a particular um, uh, group of people um, it is a sort of open it is urban it is um, a multitude of different uh, people coming from different areas uh, and therefore I think Moscow has the potential to actually become that, become that capital. So if we only look um, at Moscow there is um, a sort of um, an industrial city wall if you want. Um, the whole city center is surrounded by industry uh, along the railway ring and this um, this industrial wall in a way becomes more and more redundant uh, as industries move out as industries cease to uh, cease their production uh, in that zone and I think this is an enormous potential uh, also given and uh, this was mentioned earlier that it's actually uh, about one and a half times the size of Paris uh, and that it is only at the densities we have mo at Moscow at the moment is like, would ac allow for the accommodation of about one and a half million people. And I think there's undoubtedly more than this uh, in all the pockets of the city. But let's go to the condition we find there. Um, what is industry? What is industrial property? First of all, industry is about gates. You can usually not access the area. So it's actually only for the people that work in a particular site um, the area exists. For other people it's just a blank spot uh, in the city. That's one of the one of the big problems and I'll show you how this is uh, dealt with in, uh, in other places. The next one is that with the industry uh, moving away you're actually um, very quickly running into um, an environment which appears quite dilapidated and, uh, and run down which in a way creates a negative image which can have actually uh, even more negative effect than, uh, than having industry uh, in a particular spot. The third one is industry is about extreme scales so we have extra 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 large buildings and you have very 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 small structures um, which is um, something you don't find in most other parts of the city where the scale is somehow closer uh, together. But then you have a number of actually assets. Industry space is available now. It is very, very flexible. Uh, it is in a way undogmatic because um, yes, there is an industrial heritage, but the industrial heritage uh, does not or not yet uh, have the same status as uh, cultural buildings or basically the whole city center of Moscow where touching a single building is always a big operation and actually in a way often gets jeopardized by simply concerns about um, uh, conservation of, uh, of uh, historic buildings. Industry, is, if you do it well, has quite a sexy character and this is what, um, what especially attracts people um, that move to a city, people that are of a younger generation, people that are working uh, in the creative sectors and industry in a way can be connected to the, the whole idea of, uh, of loft living which is a sort of grandeur, which is a certain urban lifestyle. It's not living on the countryside, it's actually living in the city. Uh, I think there's simply three keys to uh, the success of redeveloping industrial areas. One is just start where it is easiest. You can be very opportunistic about where you start with things. Just take the spot which is available, where you have control, and just get going uh, with it. And then use as much as you can 
um, from what is already there. So reuse buildings rather than always going into new structures. That allows you to start rather quickly, to score, um, to score uh, results quite quickly. And it also allows for a sort of what I would call scaled approach. So you can do very big projects or you can start with very small projects. Um, depending on the funds you have available, depending on um, the, 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 the conditions, depending on land ownerships, etc., etc. So there is no need to just go for a big project and, uh, and having to deliver it. You can also start small, and many small things also uh, create a big one. Um, to show you an example, we've, um, and this was for my uh, former employer, but now um, in my own firm, we've been working on a uh, master plan for the regeneration of a former industrial area in uh, Shenzhen. And um, this is how the area looks like right now. It uh, was the first, um, the first logistics center Shenzhen had when it was developed as a special economic zone. And over the course of time, um, logistics has totally changed its needs. And the area actually has become, um, in a way, redundant for logistics. But uh, small businesses actually have moved uh, to the area. But as logistics has certain requirements, the area is not really used to, uh, to, to, to the maximum uh, capacity. Um, this was a competition, and if you know what um, the standard approach is in China about redevelopment, um, this in a way is what you have. Everything is being taken down and replaced by new structures. We actually turned this approach around and said, well, we start from keeping everything, and then we go building by building and discuss whether it can be used, reused or whether it is, um, it is not really um, up for reuse in the future. With that, we actually developed a number of spatial strategies, which you could call escalating. So very basic thing is just you reuse what is there, and then gradually you add things, you replace uh, individual buildings, um, you sometimes even establish um, for whole, whole parts of the site um, entirely new um, new structures, but always trying to keep um, the spatial logic and, um, in a way, dimensions of spaces you already you already have there. And we did this with uh, in a in a context where um, there is a very large group of very different landowners. So we actually sat down with each one of them and listened to them, and wanted to find out what their goals actually are and what they want to achieve. And uh, so in a way, it becomes a sort of piecemeal approach to, uh, to regeneration. And um, the interesting thing was that uh, some of them had already very big plans, some of them had them approved already, they were constructing uh, in parts already, and others had no idea. And so we managed, and that's the state of the discussion at the moment, to actually keep 60% of the building stock, uh, and only 40% would, uh, would be replaced. So this is what the site actually looks uh, at the moment, and this is what uh, the site could look like. Now this is an approach to, I think, regeneration, which um, sounds strange to Europeans, but in a Chinese context, this is already uh, quite an achievement to, to, to save so much of the, of the, of the existing stock. Uh, and we find it is particularly important because by saving uh, these buildings, you're also uh, protecting social networks, you're protecting, um, you're protecting interaction between people, you're protecting, in a way, um, a collective memory of a space, uh, which we find very important when you um, redevelop an area, because that is the big deficits of all new developments, that they need about 10 to 20 years to actually come to life. The second one is um, the areas need to be made more permeable, so people actually have to be able to get there, because public life only emerges if there is public space, and public space only emerges if people actually can get there. So make the areas more permeable and connect them to the city. And this is an example from, uh, from London. The Olympic Park, in a way, um, is not just an operation to make an Olympic Park and to establish a legacy, but it is also an operation of actually unlocking this area, which was barely accessible. On that map, you can see what I call the, well, the most impressive collection of dead ends uh, you can find in the world. All the red dots were um, dead ends when we started to work on the master plan. And it was actually from the onset, it was clear to us that for the Olympic Games, it's exactly what you want. You don't want to have a permeable area. You have to have highly controlled, highly secured zones. But after that, you actually have to, have to open it up and you want it to be um, fully connected to, to the rest of London. Um, and this was actually the big challenge 
uh, or one of the big challenges in this legacy plan to actually achieve that and to make build infrastructure which can be used immediately after the games um, to often serve different purposes. So what was a, an emergency entrance and exit during the games would become a full access and a full bridge uh, to the neighborhoods uh, after the games. So this is the games and then the legacy master plan not only proposes development, but it also proposes a significant investment in infrastructure and connective, re-establishing the connective tissue between the disconnected sites of the, of the Lower Lee Valley. The third one is, I think you shouldn't make two big plans. Um, I think you should actually look for what I would call a, a sort of curated piecemeal approach. So there should be a plan, but it doesn't mean that it should be necessarily a master plan that spatially defines everything. And this can be, can have very different, um, very different, uh, can take very different shapes. Um, the High Line in New York um, is not only a great piece of landscape, it's also a, in a way a curatorial device for development because of the city and private initiatives investing into the High Line as a park. Actually private businesses uh, in the vicinity start developing their property and with this investment into the device you're actually attracting a lot of investment and a lot of upgrade uh, in the neighborhood. Another one is a sort of institutionalizing of um, the curatorship and in Holland there is a lot of experience with what they call Welstand which is a sort of city um, architecture commission which advises the city and which is a very actually politically independent body which advises city governments on projects, uh, which appoints master planners for certain areas, and which in a way is in control of the whole development uh, process. And the third thing uh, in this curated uh, process is to actually use what you already have. Um, here are a number of examples, and they are all players and they should all stay in the game, so it's not, there is no point in, in excluding them from there. So there is Urban Pioneers, uh, who's been at Elektrozavod uh, factory. It's actually quite interesting to see what, how people live there and how this kind of informal um, takeover of industrial property takes place. Um, there is more institutionalized and more experienced cultural initi initiatives and there is um, what Sergei has been showing us, also a sort of more developer-driven uh, approach. And all these should actually be part of that game and also all these parties should actually stay in that game. Because if you take all these three, um, then in a way you're actually able to, um, in a way, transform this ring of fire into a very colorful kind of rainbow and something which really, I think, is capable of totally changing the image Moscow has uh, on a global scene and also totally changing the image of Moscow for uh, its own residents. Thank you. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. I believe all these lessons and conclusions need to be drawn and uh, considered, including uh, permeability and transparency and openness. Do start with build on what you already have. And Yuri also said that don't try to uh, cover the uncoverable. Don't try to do everything in one year. and. Uh, reorganize all the industrial zones we have. Now, Richard Tibet, I'd like to give the floor to you. You are part of Cushman and Wakefield, and uh, uh, you have experience in strategic consultancy and uh, real estate development, and uh, Richard uh, helps us, consults us in various projects. So I know that Richard has the understanding of both the Russian situation and as international experience. So I will be uh, happy if you could share with us. I've been asked to talk about a very large scale urban regeneration. Um, and to answer the question, how on earth do you get everybody to agree? And secondly, what on earth happens to the community? What do they get out of it? How on earth are they going to go along with it? How are they going to be happy? A little bit louder, please. Um, yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Sorry. Shall I start again? So I'm, I'm, start, I'm going to speak about um, the very large-scale urban regeneration that I've spent most of my life dealing with. Um, and to answer the difficult question, thank you, answer the difficult questions, 
Uh, firstly, with such a large and complex site, how do we get everybody to agree to the regeneration strategy? And secondly, how do we get the community to go along with it? Because we're doing stuff to their place. And so I'm, I, I have some fairly straightforward answers to that. But beyond that, the answers are predicated, they're based upon some difficult myths and falsehoods about large-scale urban regeneration that I, I want to give some opinion on as well. Okay, agreements. Because the system of thinking about regeneration has largely been um, uh, colonized by the architectural profession, who you know, are brilliant at urban thinking, uh, and I have to understand clients and the social and economic context. The assumed output of this process is a master plan, a visual representation. Now, of course, that's right. Um, pictures are worth thousands and thousands of words. But actually, you don't get agreement with that. You get vision, and you get an alignment of interests seems okay, we can go along with that generally, but we're not committed to it. What you need is the next stage, the hard yards, the nasty, technical, detailed, financial stuff about how. Master plan gives you the content, what? We need to know how, what deals, what land, when, and how is it going to work in a sensible financial way, okay? So that's my bottom line on that. How do you get an agreement? Master plan, strategic, and maybe m many, many sets of development agreements, hand in hand. Second issue, what happens to the community? Well, uh, I think you've had a reflection from uh, my colleagues from um, uh, Holland and Germany of a trend in Western Europe. You can't ignore them. When um, I started my 14 years work in Cardiff Bay, one of Europe's largest regeneration schemes, we discovered we had the world's greatest population of Somalis outside Somalia. And my goodness, were they awkward. And why were they awkward? Because we didn't pay them any attention, we didn't give them any respect, we patronized them. We showed them the master plan and said, you must love this but they hated it, because there was nothing of them in it. This was their place. So number one, forget after the fact patronizing master planning uh, that, that uh, talks to the community later on. When we did the Salford master plan, which I did with Massimiliano Fuxas, the great architect, uh, we started with them and involved the community in its many facets many times. So I think that's a big issue. The second thing is, and you heard that from the fantastic uh, uh, EchoPrint project, innovative ways of engagement of the community are very important. You probably know, you've probably gone up and down the Thames. Would you believe that some of the most interesting things on the Thames have used similar methodologies of social enterprise? The OXO Tower, for example, uh, and um, a very interesting housing on the south bank of the river happened because of community engagement. And you also heard from Marcus, the other big principle that I believe in strongly, don't destroy the place. The symbols, the spaces, the recycling of buildings give a sense of uh, passion. I'm working uh, on the re redevelopment of a very large brewery at the moment. We're not touching anything in the brewery. It's so loved, it's redolent of the brewing brand. So those are my kind of headline messages there. But what are these based on? 10 points. Myths, if you like. Well, this is just an old bit of industrial land. We can do this much quicker than if it was in the city, the proper city. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, you've got to realize that, uh, uh, well, this is, this is King's Cross done by Argent, one of Europe's very best and most creative uh, regeneration developers. Uh, and, and this just illustrates that industrial land comes in many forms. 
ports, military land, railway station, back land, and so on. And haven't we got a lot of that in Moscow to deal with? This next slide shows the seven years of argument and political documentation before this got planning permission. Seven years talking about it. Yeah? No wonder private sector developers give up, or they almost do. Argent stuck in there throughout that process. It was hugely costly. I think it was about $10 million that seven years, just to get a consent. And of course, Salford Keys, here's another one, 1984 to 2012. Salford is just west of central Manchester. Um, these, these, this is the Manchester Ship Canal, uh, which brought ships into the center of Manchester from the sea. I first started working there in 84, and you can see from this picture how it was in 1936, and by 1981 there was nothing left. And 85, we kicked off with a vision. There weren't too many people in the community to consult. And one of the first things we did was raise aspirations with a cultural project on the edge of the uh, uh, development there. This, this, this became the Lowry Center, eventually. Uh, and we, we put some housing in, very poor stuff, and everybody regrets it now, but we got some people in the community there. This then led to more catalytic development, and by 2005, there was quite an active mixed-use development. But in 2005, this was underachieving, and Manchester as a city was growing enormously, and this is when the new master plan started. When we started this master plan, we saw it as a voyage to a more progressive uh, strategy in the future, but we had no idea how lucky we would get we did all the obvious things, uh, serious bits of housing. We got very lucky when uh, the BBC were told by the government to get out of London. And they moved much of their programming and they moved it to Manchester. And we landed 5,000 jobs. We played with a media strategy, but we got 5,000 jobs from the BBC and 15,000 more from the technological clusters that relate to them. We got lucky, but we created the conditions of success. Second big myth, it's re which is that it's only really the private developers that know what the hell they're doing. Wrong. Just look at the Olympic site. Let's not forget that uh, an agency of, of government, a joined up agency that Marcus worked brilliantly for, um, relocated about uh, and, and sorted out the problems of about 200 businesses that were on this site. This was grossly polluted, incredibly difficult place. Uh, and this is the site in, um, in November 2008, just under four years out from the Games. Uh, and, and of course, it, the public sector finished this using the best of talent, right? but it was the public sector, six months early, and $750 million under budget, three quarters of a billion dollars under budget. This is a, a wonderful public sector um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, result. Now, going on from there, what has happened is an enormous groundswell of um, uh, uh, private sector development. Westfield and its 1.65 billion pounds uh, shopping center. Uh, Delancey um, and its enormous developments of, in housing, uh, office development and so on. Uh, and this will be a coming place in London within visual link of Canary Wharf. It's still a long way out, uh, but this was the east end of London that when I was a lad you never went to. It was very dangerous. Next myth you have to take into account is that normal development finance can deliver a result. This is the five-year perspective. What this graph shows is that when you do big picture regen work, you're looking at the green graph line. Loads of work in the ground on which there's very little payback with a hope for higher payback later. Normal development is more like the blue line. But if you notice, when the finance has to be paid back, perhaps in five years' time, 
You know, there's not much, there's actually no profit around if you're investing heavily in the infrastructure. Yeah? Big point. So it's very different from normal development. I'm talking here about very large site uh, regeneration, not uh, e examples of more sensible scale sites. Uh, next myth we have here is... Um, Sorry for interrupting you, just two minutes. Ago. Okay. Uh, the private sector can pay for infrastructure. Well, it just can't. Uh, this is Cardiff Bay, the enormous investment there. And you really can't leave public domain development till later uh, because it's vital to stimulating new investment. And let's just remember the economic cycle. Brindley Place in Birmingham got it right. Started in 93 and completed before layman's went bust. Look what was achieved in central Birmingham. In Carlsberg, Carlsberg City in Copenhagen, they're wrestling with a much more difficult problem. The company closed its brewery in 2008 and this will stand still maybe until 2015, 2016. Meanwhile, they're doing all the things. So, um, just uh, uh, one other point. One, some people say when you're tackling a big site, what you want is a massive transformational project. Give us a university, give us an opera house. Wrong. You can do great things with small projects. This in Cardiff Bay costs $600,000. Um, uh, um, uh, dollars and, and created a sense of progress and pride early on in the development. So, um, I better skip to my last slide, really. Yeah, I'm sorry about the time. Um, and, and other people say what we really need is a, is a sector strategy um, and a great architect. Uh, both are true, but a great architect needs, as somebody said early, great colleagues to think about the strategy and the economics at the same time. Thanks. Thank you very much, Richard. I would now like to give the floor to our next speaker who has uh, great experience in developing new areas. Uh, we're talking about uh, renovation of new areas, uh, new buildings, industrial zones. Abdurrahman Karib heads up the smart city organization that built in the United Arab Emirates uh, quite a significant number of business parks, about a dozen, uh, I think, and beyond the Arab Emirates. And I believe this experience can be useful for us in uh, developing new Moscow, new areas uh, of Moscow connected uh, to it where we are to create new jobs. So please share your experiences with us, Fried. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start with what we have done in Dubai 12 years ago, and this is our first project. Uh, we called it Dubai Internet City, and it's about creating a cluster of all ICT, information, communication, and technology companies in one place. <clears throat> and the logos at the, at that you see at the bottom of the slide, this is some more projects that we developed within the 12 years. So far in Dubai, we have 10 uh, parks, 10 business parks, 10 clusters, and they're all uh, under whether it's ICT, or media, three, education, four, science and technology, fifth is what we call it uh, entertainment. This is Dubai in 2000. And what you see next to it is, du is Dubai today. So this is in a span of 10 years. And we thank the companies, which you see the brands and the logos at the bottom of the slide, where they came and they invested with us in our uh, countries. So having the industries within uh, the city, it makes uh, a big difference. 
This is where uh, Dubai Intensity uh, is today. This is what you see is today. Ten years ago, there was nothing. Even the Palm Island, which is, I'm sure everybody have heard about it, it wasn't uh, there. But what happened that when we started developing Dubai Intensity and creating jobs, then everybody came around us. Hotels came around us, residential uh, projects came around us, some retail. And, and, and after when the financial crisis came, uh, still Dubai Internet City, Media City, there are three zones we have in that area. There is still the prime location. And this is the time where the, they made us uh, to become a prime uh, location and other, like and other uh, locations. This is our vision, what we decided in 2006 to take the know-how of developing clusters in Dubai to take them internationally. And we explored many locations uh, internationally and, and for the first project we chose uh, Malta to be our first project of smart city. Our international brand is uh, smart city. Uh, and also we have another project in India, southwest of India, in a city called uh, Kuchi. The whole idea is how to expand our spectrum of, uh, of the, the clients and our, what, we call, what we call them in our terminology, our business partners. And also how to, to see that the, in terms of human capital between the different uh, locations. Just what I would like to highlight here is that Every location, every city in the world, it has its advantages and its disadvantages when it comes to knowledge economy, whether it's IT or uh, media education. So that's why for us is to, to enlarge the spectrum of our business partners, we chose uh, to go international and also not to put all the eggs in one basket. This is our Malta project. Uh, what you see on the, on the left side is the land today, and what you see on the right is the master plan for Malta project. It consists of four categories. 64% of the master plan is office space. Then we have hotels and retail, which is a very important component for us. And then there is the uh, residential within the same uh, master plan. Unlike, in, unlike Dubai, in Dubai we focused mainly on office space. The rest came around us. But in Malta we insisted to have all the categories. The fourth category, which is we believe it's very important, is the public space, open space. 33% of the master plan is open space. We also, uh, the first building that we finished, it's a green building. So we. <clears throat> strongly believe in sustainability and where to use the solar uh, energy and where to come even the master plan is we consider it a green master plan the total roads for cars are available in this master plan is less than four kilometers the rest is pedestrian and for cycling even the roads on the on the seashore which is the one kilometer of seashore there is no cars can be allowed it's only pedestrian and cycling so the, the history is repeating itself again. We did it in 2000 in Dubai. Now again we are doing it in Malta. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Farid. Uh, to me personally, this experience is uh, unique because over a short period of time, some fantastic facilities have been built. And... Uh, uh, tourists are now being attracted, uh, and business people, and uh, these parks uh, now uh, attract startups, small companies from across the world, uh, something we uh, argue in Moscow many times, the existence of this uh, requirement. What's more important for companies, infrastructure, or things like that? Well, the Dubai example says that when you have a good infrastructure, good conditions, startups and innovative companies will come and grow in that location. Unfortunately, we are running out of time and we still have many experts present here, but I believe we will try and uh, give the floor to all of them. Very briefly, very quickly, let's start with Sergey Lovkin, responsible for the urban construction department uh, in the city of Moscow, 
And uh, Sergey, could you please comment on what you've heard today can be realized, what can be done, what cannot be done, what issues are there? Just a couple of minutes. Yes, thank you very much. This is an interesting role today because it's usually uh, experts who are invited to speak with uh, uh, government officials and now the other way, a government official is uh, uh, called to comment on what experts uh, were saying. But this is important. What I wanted to say in the beginning is that uh, I believe that the Moscow needs industry. Uh, that's what we talked about. How to arrange it in two aspects. Number one, uh, economics, uh, the city revenues, and number two, uh, urban development solutions. Because the first issue, first problem is transportation. This is number one in this city. We cannot resolve that by just building roads and hubs uh, and transportation uh, uh, facilities. We cannot restrict uh, personal uh, vehicles and parking lots. We need to also uh, migrate jobs. This is another issue that doesn't allow the city to live comfortably. So our industrial zones are in the master plan. There's 17% uh, of all area, out of which 4.3 thousand hectares can be arranged. They're between the third and fourth transportation rings, for those of you who know Moscow. And if we stop the flow of uh, um, workforce on the old territory, then we will stop 40% of uh, the population coming to the inside the garden ring where we have 40% of all jobs. So rearranging and developing uh, production areas is a key priority for the government and owners of this territory and those who do development. Now, each speaker said, and each one has its own project, they're all different about uh, different territories in industrial zones. I made the conclusion, or at least confirmed my own conclusion, that each territory requires individual approach, starting from Berlin, where you have a social project and no profits, it's just a local community who decided to transform part of the area and then the profitable Stanislavski project and other projects in other cities. But at the same time, I totally agree with Yuri, who said that uh, you need uh, to uh, um, have uh, this one ideology. The ideology, philosophy should be the head of any transformation of uh, zones. Without uh, philosophy, we will create pieces of territory not connected with the skeleton, with the idea of transforming, reforming the city and eliminating the disproportions that Moscow has developed in the recent years. I uh, would like to say thank you to our predecessor, our grandfathers who created those industrial zones, which make it possible for us with the right solutions to bring the city back to a comfortable uh, living environment. Thank you. Thank you, Sergey. Now, I would uh, like very much to give the floor to Pamela Delfinich, who is both an architect and uh, head of the campus planning design group from MIT, and uh, who was and is part of the Skolkovo project. So she's aware of our realities. Uh, you have the floor. smaller scale. <clears throat> I uh, work at a university of 10,000 people located in a city of 100,000 people. Very, very tiny. But the issues are all exactly the same. I found myself thinking during the course of the presentations that not all the industrial space, I agree with Sergey, not all the industrial space can become something other than industrial space. Maybe there's an opportunity to rethink the types of industry that are located in these buildings without demolishing them. That's actually what's happening around MIT. MIT has become 
in 100 years has developed into the highest density of high-tech and biotech startups in the world. Not the largest number, but the highest density. We find ourselves running out of land. Um, it's all been developed. The land all around the campus has been developed. The land in the campus and adjacent to the campus is all intertwined. And, um, but we're finding ourselves with the campus and with all of the industry, what we're lacking is housing, what we're lacking is lifestyle. That's our next challenge. So it has to be a balanced approach. Um, I appreciated what Marcus had to say. He provided sort of a step-by-step -step pragmatic approach to how to get from here to there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, colleague, поскольку времени... Colleagues, since we have no more time left, and uh, we would like still to um, use the opportunity and uh, listen to our guests, speakers, and experts, I suggest we had planned the voting. Uh, let's uh, uh, cancel that and give the chance to the experts that we've invited to ask their questions to our today's speakers and give the chance to those in the audience to ask their questions. I would now like uh, to ask Mr. Siemens, uh, Senior Vice President, Managing Director of the Russian Rep Office of Heinz, to tell us about a couple of words about what he heard today, and maybe you have any questions to our today's presenters. Thank you. on this. There are a lot of interesting points both today and previously. A couple of them stick out. One, there seems to be an enormous opportunity in the city of Moscow with 15,000 hectares or 8,000 hectares of industrial prom zones that can be developed. That may be unique in the world of cities of a world-class nature like Moscow. So that opportunity comes with enormous possibilities as well as responsibilities. It can be done well or poorly. And how it's done is important for both investors as well as the city of Moscow and its citizens. Two, urban renewal versus urban sprawl. That was mentioned in yesterday's master planning session. Urban sprawl causes traffic, congestion, etc. Urban renewal provides opportunities for the energetic and uh, economically active people to come into the city. So there's demand for uh, a lot of space. That means residential, that means offices, commercial, everything. Third, urban renewal is very expensive. We did a 45 hectare site in Paris with our two French partners and it was five and a half billion dollars. To do 8,000 hectares is a trillion dollars, so it's very expensive. And there are very serious questions about who pays for what. Private investors have to make a profit. The city has to invest in public infrastructure, particularly transport infrastructure, to avoid congestion. So there's an opportunity, there's demand, and there's a need for money. I represent a company that could probably invest several billion dollars into, into these type of developments, but it's not happening yet, and the question is why. And I think that there are several important points. Investors need clarity. And what I mean by that, what can you build and how much of it can you build? Second, if you're going to invest in a site, you need to know your neighbors are doing the same quality of investment that you're doing. You can make a very high quality investment consistent with the master plan we've seen for Zill and find your neighbors doing uh, penalized, very cheap housing and too, and too dense. So you have to know it will be consistent. And third, you have to know what the costs are, both the upfront costs, ongoing costs, infrastructure costs, costs like demolition, environmental cleanup, land privatization, and public infrastructure. And Who's going to pay for that? The city, investors, and when it's going to be paid and how it's going to be paid. I think the city understands all of this, and I compliment Mr. Komisarov and his colleagues for what they've been doing at Zill. That's excellent. But that addresses only the first two questions. It doesn't address the third, which is cost, who pays, how you pay, and what the process is. So I think now it's time to engage the private sector to find out clear, transparent ways to address that third question. The other issue is that Zill is perhaps one of the unique assets where it's owned by the city 
principally. And there are 90% of these industrial sites are owned by private investors. So you also have to find the mechanism for how to quickly and transparently deal with all of these questions. What you can build, how you can build, um, the quality of what you build, and who pays the costs and how those costs are engaged. If that happens, Moscow can have an enormous future in urban renewal of these prom zones throughout the city. Thank you. No doubt about it. Thank you. And uh, for the brief uh, review, I would like uh, Daryl Starefold. Daryl is uh, a chairman of Urban Land Institute. is is working for 17 years. Daryl, is that true? And uh, several words about your opinion. Uh, what uh, have you heard here at this discussion? I believe, thank you very much, Alisa, and it's important to understand that uh, large uh, patches of land like Zil is a long-term process, and I agree that uh, there is no need to rush uh, in the development of this site, but to do it uh, properly, to create this clarity, uh, what uh, we heard uh, right now, and uh, as far as Zil, during which uh, time you are planning to accomplish this uh, project on ZIL is uh, a very good example of the scope and uh, to understand the length of the project. Thank you. Daryl, we have one more expert here, Oleg Pachinko. He is the director uh, of uh, the Research Center of Applied uh, research and Oleg is dealing with the same problem uh, and he is working in St. Petersburg. Thank you. I'm not going to talk about our project in St. Petersburg. Uh, I will have a chance to do that at the open site uh, and briefly I'd like to mention four points which I heard in the presentations of the speaker and I uh, thought they are extremely important and deserve to be mentioned in Berlin project everybody paid attention that this is a socially oriented project it's not our context and it's uh, we are too far from that but uh, I would like uh, to tell you what artists did to receive support they started to create projects for people not for themselves that's how they presented and positioned their projects. They're doing it for the people. They created it for the people, and the community continues to live there. So, of course, we are far from that kind of uh, approach. The second, Stanislavski approach, the factory. I was very much impressed, and an extremely important example to be mentioned in the future that the owners were against the idea of opening this space, but in the end they opened the place and uh, it started to work. They became famous in Moscow. No vandal events are taking place, and uh, it's one of the myths, actually, uh, uh, of those who are afraid of open their boundaries and it works nicely and thirdly the third uh, element which I wanted to comment everybody is talking about the necessity of partnership and everybody is talking about this and everybody spoke about this that uh, we have to do these projects in most various types of partnerships uh, private and uh, state, uh, if we analyze large-scale developers' uh, projects in, in, in the West, in Europe, and in the United States, there might be 10 to 15 participants of a consortium representing the interests of stakeholders. And uh, finally, the projects uh, appear to be even better when it is done only by one developer. The point is, what are the futures, uh, what are perspectives, how skillful we are in negotiating things uh, uh, legally and uh, institutionally. And uh, I think we don't have any other options. We will have to learn to do that, and uh, we will touch upon this uh, topic at our own presentation. Thank you, Oleg. And colleague. Uh, we have exceeded our uh, the timing in the agenda. We believe we need to answer one or two questions, uh, please. Uh, 
I am Galina Zaleska from Belarus, from Minsk, and Minsk has a, a very rich industrial history and a question to the speaker. Can we summarize today's uh, discussion on the functionality aspect in three reports uh, in 30 percent we touched upon the industrial functions uh, and uh, if the industrial function is preserved, I wonder if the industrial function will be preserved in Moscow. So uh, let's uh, ask our speakers whether the manufacturing facility, manufacturing process should remain and continue to be. Of course, the answer is positive if it doesn't pollute uh, water and air. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, a Berlin has much less amount of um, industries. Also, years ago, it, it's just not an industrial city in that extent, and um, so we have less. To, to, but what I want to say, I think the, the term, I think industries is one thing, but yesterday we had the idea of that it's smaller businesses now that are maybe also manufacturing businesses but not this kind of um, like huge fabrics and, and to provide space and also maybe space that is located in the inner city um, to manufacturing businesses is still I think something very good I mean it, it, it's, it's, it's one one fragment in, in, in the developments. Yeah. Okay, thank you what about you? Well, it's a difficult question for you, I think, but just... Yes, no, sorry. Okay, uh, this is my first visit to, to Moscow. Yeah. This is my first visit to Moscow, and I'm not aware about the urban, uh, how it is planned. But let me give you another example. In Malta, when we, uh, when we did the agreement with the government there, and they allocated the land, uh, it was industrial area. Yeah. And we looked what we can use from that industrial area. Actually, we couldn't use except for the power connection that was there and the fiber optic that was in that, uh, allocated in that land. Mm -hmm. The rest, it was, the buildings were very uh, badly uh, managed and built. And also it was, I would say, 27% of the land, they were contaminated. So we had to bring them down, clean, and then start again from, from there. So, I think it's all about how we are responsible about the site and where we want to be and what, where, and what we want to achieve about it. Thank you. Thank you. Just yes or no? Yes. Keep yeah. jobs. Okay. Uh, Marcus. Um, I think keeping jobs is, uh, is essential to a place. Um, but I think we should also stop talking about industry as something which is a problem per se. I think the industry of tomorrow is not the industry of the 19th or early 20th century, which is extremely polluting and um, negatively impacts your life to the extent that you can't live next to a factory. Um, I'm living very close to a factory and that's not a problem. Um, so I think it's about enforcing legislation which you already have and those industries which are really problematic to actually have a plan how you face them out of areas where uh, you have a lot of residents, but with that you can just keep all the industry you, you want to have in the city. Okay, thank you. Yuri. Я думаю, что да, и учитывая то, что у нас, в общем, достаточно отстал. I believe that uh, we have a fairly uh, obsolete level of uh, industry, and uh, at Zill we uh, we actually suggested to maintain this uh, manufacturing as a, as a performance. It shouldn't be closed. Uh, thank you very much. One more question, colleagues? We can pass over the microphone. Danilo Svetlana Vedemistin, newspaper. A question is about the existing enterprises like uh, oil refinery in Moscow. Is it's the only dangerous thing in the megapolis? Are we planning to do something with this hazardous area in Moscow? 
I will try to answer. Yes, it is planned. It is being done. About 10 billion rubles uh, were invested by the owners, and uh, they have to reduce the emissions by 98 percent. Uh, revolutionary changes are there. It's the example how to minimize the harmful effects. Colleagues, unfortunately, we are lagging behind, and I'd like to thank all the speakers. And uh, I believe it was useful and interesting, and I'm sure that industrial areas of Moscow is a tremendous potential, and uh, it's up to us to use properly this potential because uh, the future depends on that. Thank you.